flash melting for lead, but, but I don't have any further information about that. So, would you please mute your microphone? It's it's uh, rather noisy here. <laughs> it's okay, Becca. We still can uh, hear your voice clearly. Okay, good. So, in addition to this, to this uh, flash melting, there are also continuous converting technology based on flash melting and this direct to blister variation for for uh, for uh, specific concentrates. And if you would like to hear something about the statistics, so so the new copper smelter to be built in Indonesia will be fifty uh, seventh furnace unit built by Oldtech. And some of them are not, not in use anymore, but the total number uh, is, is 57. And it means that, that uh, flash melting technology is used in several locations in the world. And uh, it's producing quite nice fraction of total copper, copper and nickel in the world. Let's then take this kind of big picture of, of uh, copper smelting technology development. What was copper smelting in, in the historical years? Uh, meaning roasting step, smelting step, and converting step in, in, in different furnaces and, and very, very long duration of the process altogether several days uh, from concentrate to, to copper. When flash melting was, was invented or put in industrial use, these roasting and smelting steps were combined to one smelting step. And then there was a converting, converting after, after flash melting. And 1978, the first direct to blister smelting furnace was 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 started up, and uh, meaning that there are uh, few ore bodies in the world which have either low iron or they are in high copper, and they allow this one step smelting process from concentrate to metal to be carried out. So what kind of furnace vessels those flash melting, flash converting and direct to blister furnaces are? They are composed of three functional furnace uh, compartment, so to say, reaction shaft, settler part, and uptake. And as a kind of organic part of, of all this, this um, furnace vessel, there is a much larger, much more, more uh, volume in heat recovery systems for the gas. And, and uh, that uh, heat recovery system produces primarily steam, which can be then converted uh, to electricity or uh, any steam needed in the, in the smelter itself or some other industrial unit next to the smelter. So, so it is very useful um, for the total kind of energy balance of, of, the, of the smelter. So this is how direct to blister flash smelter looks like. We have number of of uh, op 
operational units there from concentrate bedding and, and mixing and, and drying uh, to flash melting furnace itself, heat recovery boiler and acid plant after that. And, and then, then this blister copper is, is fire refined in anode furnaces and slag is cleaned once or twice, depending on, on its, its uh, chemistry uh, in electric furnaces for, for, for the recovery of, of uh, copper first. And then if there are some other valuable metals, the second slag cleaning step may be, may be uh, taking out those metals from the slag. And anode casting certainly is the last last point in at the smelter where where uh, anode plates for the electro electric uh, electrolytic refinery of, of copper is is um, fed to. So I will shortly look at some <clears throat> some key reactions. Uh, which are generally applicable in all flash melting independently whether they are uh, mat making mode direct to blister mode or 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 uh, continuous converting flash converting reactions so we have reaction soft here where iron oxides and sulfur dioxide is, is formed from the minerals, from the sulfide minerals of the feed mixture. And in here, those, those <clears throat> reactions between the gas and its oxygen and the solids of the feed mixture are taking place and that's it so this is the this is the heat generator the chemical chemical uh, reaction zone of of the main chemical reaction zone of the flash furnace and uh, all material coming into this um, reaction soft roof through this reaction soft uh, roof is at room temperature and here on the level of settler roof temperature on the average is 1300 centigrade so this is this reaction shaft is the key chemical reactor which is doing all the oxidation taking place in the in the smelting furnace settler separates gas which is uh, led to the uptake and and heat recovery boiler from the condensed condensed phases which are collected by the settler uh, heart so to say and um, in map making uh, smelters, the actual formation of slag and mat is taking place on the on the surface, upper surface of of the of the settler uh, melt, so to say, and also blister. Uh, in blister processes, uh, the slag formation, final slag formation is, is taking place in the settler. Actually, the copper is formed in the reaction soft uh, in, in, in direct to blister processes. So what kind of, what kind of um, processing unit this, this reaction soft is? It's, uh, it has a very short reaction time. 
from two to three seconds. So during that time, all reactions heating up the material oxidation of, of particles must take place. And it means that, that uh, your feed mixture must be dry and it must be fine. Dryness allows uh, rapid heating and fine. Fineness also means that it, it will capture uh, thermal energy by its surfaces very, very fast. So there is upper grain size or particle size for material, which can be can be smelted in all these flash melting uh, processes. So raw materials, those ones <clears throat> which are which are sulfides, they ignite at a certain temperature, which is characteristic to the, to the mineral. And that is from say 500 to 700 degrees centigrade. And once ignition occurs, the reactions, the combustion, combustion reactions in the rea reaction shaft are very, very rapid in pro pro taking place in 10 to 20 milliseconds. And the particle temperatures are increasing very rapidly to say 2000 or something. And those particles are then heating, heating the gas. So there's a rather complicated uh, tra transport system of energy, which, which is initiated by the combustion of individual uh, sulfide minerals. So the reactions in, in general uh, are oxida oxidation reactions of sulfides and the degree of reaction, how far these oxidation reactions go it depends what you are doing there. If you are doing direct to blister smelting, you are producing copper and iron oxides. And then, then, uh, then these iron oxides are later on forming, forming uh, slag and, and uh, blister copper is, is, is uh, forming the blister layer in the, in the heart of the furnace. This, this uh, <clears throat> very sensitive reaction pattern means that, that small fractions of sulf sulfide minerals are oxidized completely. And the big ones are not heated up to the ignition temperature and they go through the reaction shaft without, practically without oxidation. What the reaction shaft must do, it must generate all the energy the process needs downstream. So that means that, that, that it must compensate heat losses heat up the gas, heat up the solids, uh, also those solids which are not, not ignited like sand for, for making slag. And uh, the question is how we do that. And the trick is that, that we are regulating the uh, the feed of inert materials, those, those materials which are not com combusted or reacting chemically in, in the reaction shaft. So we, we, control, we control the oxygen enrichment of the process gas, incoming cold process gas, 
and then we control the feed rates of inert materials such as scrap uh, and and slag concentrate into in in the feed mixture and this really means that we need to know exactly what are the assays of raw materials we are feeding into the flash melting furs. This type of diagram is, is often used for, for visualizing the heat balance. We have here, here the mat grade produced and this left hand side is is the heat of reaction which is generated by the by the field mixture and on the right hand side we have we have components which are then then uh, extracting that that chemical heat there are heat losses on the upper part of of the of the, the diagram there are, there is nitrogen flow which is inert doesn't react at all. There is SO2, slag and mat and, and, and so on. Also flue dust is one uh, component which, is, which, which must be taken into account in the heat balance calculations. Okay, let's go in, in details in, in this, this uh, process chemistry, which may be the interesting part for you. Of, of, of the processing. So let's look at the ways to uh, control the furnace, its uh, heat balance and the mat grade, which can be controlled in autotech type of flash melting furnaces. And let's look also at, at certain thermodynamic constraints, which are uh, more or less valid in, in flash melting uh, settler, which can be later on used for, for example, for uh, calculating properties of, of slag and mat uh, in an industrial furnace. So, how we control what kind of mat or what kind of blister copper we are producing in the furnace. The key variable there is, 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 the, is the oxygen coefficient, which is defined as, as, as the volume of oxygen needed for, uh, for metric ton of dry, feed mixture. And it is characteristic to each feed mixture and, and it's all components. So in certain, and in many smelters which are using a uh, number of concentrates at a time, they may be from uh, three to even to 10, 10 different concentrates. They are mixing those concentrates in, in different ratios so every ratio has its own characteristic oxygen coefficient so that means that if if we have our oxygen true oxygen coefficient in the in the industrial furnace higher than than our set point in terms of mat grade or sulfur concent concentration in blister. So if, if lambda is higher, higher than, than expected, our tap blister copper is lower in sulfur or our, our mat grade is higher. So we have less iron in, in our copper mat. And if, if the real lambda is, is lower than the set point, so our tap so copper, blister copper has higher sulfur content. It, it is less oxidized than, than we wish it to be. And that means that 
we need to know what we are putting in our our furnace but also that 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 uh, device which is used for introducing uh, gas and concentrate mixture feed mixture in the in the furnace must operate uh, in a stable way and correctly so we we have we have uh, concentrate burner in the reaction shaft which is doing this job and it's the key instrument of stable operation and stable assays of our products meaning blister copper mat slag whatever we are we are producing so let's let's go back in 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 the reactions of chemistry in in detail so as i said all oxidation reactions between gas and and solid materials take place in the reaction shaft suspension this is this means that there is no free oxygen in the atmosphere after the reaction shaft and this also means that the final formation of slag and blister copper chemistries occur uh, in the in the settler and, and most reactions are taking place just below the reaction shaft. So we have we have there uh, blister making reactions, which out of these four, these two upper ones are taking place in the in the suspension in the reaction shaft, producing iron oxides, sulfur dioxide, and, and copper. And then, then these final kind of adjusting reactions take place in the settler where some oxygen and sulfur is dissolved in the, in the uh, blister and also some <clears throat> copper is remaining in the slag. And then these slag making reactions which mostly take place in the in the in the settler because of rather rare collisions of particles in the in the reaction shaft which which means that that uh, we have we have uh, magnetite copper oxide wustite present in the in the fully oxidized mixture which then react together in, in the settler and we have also some oxides and sulfides which go through the reaction shaft and some oxides like alumina, lime, uh, magnesia and silica which, which, which are actually uh, forming uh, slag but not chemically changing their 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 um, status in in the in the process so we are not uh, introducing any gas in the settler all oxygen and sulfur which may be reacting in in there they come through these reaction soft reactions and uh, the process is finalized in the settler when, when these um, over-oxidized and under-oxidized particles react together in, the, in there. So the situation just below the, the reaction shaft looks like this. We have, we have oxides, sulfides, uh, coming from the reaction shaft and then we have a rather thin layer of 
of, uh, of reacting particles where, uh, where these over and under oxidized particles react, forming small amount of S uh, SO2 and slag as well as blister copper. So this gives us a possibility to at least give an approximation of the chemical state of, of that zone where the final copper and slag is, is formed. We know from visual observations that, uh, that here is clear bubbling taking place in, in the furnace. And that bubbling means that there is SO2 coming out uh, from reactions between typically uh, magnetite, which is the end product, product of, of iron oxidation uh, reactions in the reaction shaft, sulfur, which, is, which may be as, as, a, as a copper sulfide there uh, to form, uh, so sulfur in blister, to form FeO and SO2. And the only possibility to have bubbling there is that the partial pressure of, of SO2 is higher than your prevailing total pressure of, of your smelter site. So, so this uh, reaction may be used, and I have, I have done that before, in, in estimating uh, the chemical st state of, of, the, of the matte blister copper and, and slag when they are formed in flash melting furnace. And I will show you later some estimations made for, for blister, direct to blister processes. So this, this gives an extra boundary condition in the sense of, of thermodynamics for, for the mat making and direct to blister making, making flash melting uh, processes. So what, what we need to run properly and in a stable way um, a flash melting furnace, independently whether that, that flash melting furnace is really a mat making furnace, flash converting furnace, or, or direct to blister uh, furnace. We have, what we have to have in the re reaction shaft, uh, gas solid suspension which allows fast heat up to ignition. And then even in big smelters, very big smelters, it's not scale dependent in, in as such, the oxidation reactions, which then start beyond ignition, they are, very, very rapid. But the, it has been estimated that, that between those reacting particles, there are not too many uh, collisions. So that means that practically no slag is formed in flight. So during the fall uh, or flight, from, from the concentrate burner down to the settler. So there are independent reactions and, and uh, collisions which are necessary for collisions between slag formers, fluxes, and, and other, other particles. They are so rare that, that practically all slag in blister making processes is formed in the, in the settler and also in mat making flash melting furnaces the mat 
is doing the same. We have always some inert material in the smelter and in smelting. So we typically flux our uh, iron oxides with silica sand and that, that silica sand is not com combustible at all. So, and it's, it's rather big in, in particle size, meaning that, that it takes time uh, to heat up those millimeter, two, three millimeters uh, in diameter silica grains. And here is a kind of simulation. It's, um, it's fluid dynamic simulation from early, early 2000 about heating up uh, of silica particles with different sizes. And we, we see that in, in, in millimeter size uh, silica particles, we don't within say three seconds, we, we don't reach more than 200 degrees centigrade um, with, with such, such materials. So there's no combustion heat, which, which is heating up those inerts. And, and that, that is why they kind of drop through, through, through the reaction shaft without, uh, without essentially reacting there at all. So that is why <clears throat> we have a maximum particle size for, for the combustible, also for the combustible minerals, or if we are feeding mat in a flask converting. So we need to get, get those materials ignited at around 400 to 700 degrees centigrade. And uh, if we have very coarse particles, which are typically slack concentrate or, or sand, they remain rather cold during the fall or flight and react in, heat up and react in settler only. All right. I have a few slides about fluxing practices in copper metallurgy. Also valid, these are valid in nickel because, because the concentrates and, and the processes are relatively similar. Uh, and meaning, meaning that, that uh, all these data can be, can be applied also for nickel matte smelting uh, cases. So why we are needing fluxes in, in, in copper and nickel metallurgy. So um, we have a lot of iron in our typical copper concentrates. Typically more than copper. So that means that, that our system will be generating a lot of iron oxides. And all these iron oxides at copper making temperatures are solid. So this is iron uh, hematite phase diagram showing 1300 centigrade temperature and all oxides, in, including certainly iron itself, they are solid at that temperature. So we must add something <clears throat> for uh, melting those, those iron oxides. And we use either silica sand, uh, lime or mixtures of them for fluxing iron oxides. Otherwise we can't get them out from the, from the smelting furnace by tapping. Then one reason and one issue which, which is involved in, in uh, fluxing is, is the gang material of 
minerals of, of, the, of the concentrates, they sometimes contain difficult uh, components, too much magnesia, too much silica, and those issues must be taken into account when selecting uh, the fluxing chemistry. But anyhow, iron silicate slags are the most common uh, system for, for copper and nickel slags. And even in, in direct to blister processes, they are the basis of, of, of the smelting, actually. Uh, so all features of iron silicate slags are generated by, by the ternary iron oxides silica system, which, which is described here uh, with, with some uh, liquidus isotherms uh, showing homogeneous uh, slag domain and then saturation or primary boundaries of of uh, bustite, FeO, magnetite, and, and then silica. And these silica and magnetite phase boundaries are the important phase boundaries in copper making uh, from many reasons. So they are also indicating actually the most oxidizing uh, point of, uh, of, the, of the slag, which locates in double saturation of silica and magnetite. Oxygen partial pressures are the key variable in copper and nickel smelting. And uh, let's look at, at those in more detail. Uh, so they are determining the assays of blister copper ore or the mat. And sometimes, sometimes uh, people just tend to look at, at old dark and at curry uh, phase diagrams dating back to, to early 50s and American Ceramic Society compilations. And these actually, these oxygen isobars are not isothermal. They are uh, plotted along the liquidus surface. So liquidus isotherms are here as in the previous picture which, which, which was calculated calculated diagram and these are these are the oxygen isobars at liquidus temperatures. We are rather seldomly following and we are not wanting to so follow, follow the liquidus temperatures at all in industrial smelting because that causes problems in, in viscosity. And, and, and fluidity of, of the slag. So more kind of reasonable starting point is to look at, at isothermal um, uh, diagrams, which uh, combine phase diagram and, and, and oxygen isobars here. They are not in, in, in the same angle as, as, as those previous ones. And these are showing actually the isocomposition of your product in copper smelting, whether that is, is, is uh, mat making or blister making uh, firms. So, so be careful when you look at, at, at uh, 
compilations and, and, and literature and, and be sure that you are, you are looking at correct boundary conditions also in thermo thermodynamic phase diagrams and, and, and their combinations with, with uh, the, like here with the activity data. Okay, what happens with, with the blister when it is generated in the, in the um, reaction shaft and when it's entering the, the settler? So what, what, what kind of chemical processes take place there and how uh, copper losses are formed in blister making. So blister copper dissolves significant fractions of, of oxygen and sulfur, depending on the temperature of processing and prevailing atmospheric, uh, so total pressure of the smelter. There is no big, big deal what, what kind of slag we have because this is kind of internal property of, 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 the, of the blister copper itself. So we have different, different total pressures and, and different solubilities of oxygen as a function of, of sulfur uh, in the blister. And the chemistry dictating this, this uh, curve and, and this, this uh, property of, of blister is simply the dissolution of, of SO2 into, into uh, blister. So it dissolves sulfur and oxygen. Uh, and uh, when we are oxidizing our charge, our feed mixture further and further, we are going down in the sulfur content of or sulfur concentration of, of, of the blister, but at the same time, our oxygen concentration is going up. This is why, why blister copper is, is actually boiling and, and, and um, fuming in the launders when, when when furnace is tapped. And that is why we need to cover those launders to, to be sure that, that in order to be sure that, 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 um, that, the, that the smelter operators are not, uh, not uh, getting too much of that SO2 coming from the material into their systems. So this dissolution of, of sulfur and oxygen is rather strongly dependent on, on, on temperature, smelting temperature. So, so we have two variables. We have the end point of, of, the, of the blister sulfur, which, which is set by by the operators, and, and then we have set point of, of temperature for the furnace. And if, if we increase the set point of the temperature, we at the same time increase the solubility of, of oxygen, uh, which is, which is at, at the fixed uh, sulfur content suddenly. So, so this is important and this is important also from other reasons like refractory wear and, 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 um, and such uh, issues because, uh, because we don't want to damage our furnaces with overheating it. So we should operate at, at, at uh, low temperatures 
as low as possible. And then, then the grade of the blister copper is somewhat determined by, by the downstream operation. So anode furnace treatment and fire refining of blister copper. So it's not something you can independently select at your smelter. So the sulfur <clears throat> content of, of our blister copper, it's, it's a clear and, uh, and good measure of, of the oxidation degree of the smelting. So if we lower the sulfur content, we need to oxidize uh, our system further on. And that means that if, if we are, as seen before, <clears throat> if we are lowering our sulfur content in blister, we are increasing its oxygen, co oxygen content because of, of, the, of the link interlinking relations between dissolved sulfur oxygen and, and the prevailing SO2 in your furnace. Why <clears throat> sulfur as an indicator for, uh, for, for the oxidation degree, for the grade of, of your blister? That is because it's practically the only, only um, easily measurable variable uh, which we, ca we can determine from our smelting assays. From the from the slag, or from the blister itself. The other possible possibility would be iron content, but it's very very small in blister copper of this type at these temperatures. So so the difference between the sulfur content and an iron content is about two orders of magnitude and, and it's, it's not easy to measure uh, iron contents of this magnitude. And why this, this traditional way of, of measuring the oxidation degree in copper smelting is not applicable, is not valid in direct to blister smelting is, it is told by this curve. It is the experimental magnetite content as a function of, of copper in, in slag. This is from Autotex uh, pilot uh, furnace uh, and probably also from KCM smelter data from Zambia. And this means that magnetite content of auto slag has been determined using the standard equipment at match smelting uh, smelters, uh, Satmagan, which is uh, de detecting only magnetite, it's not detecting trivalent iron oxide uh, as a total, but it's detecting only magnetite. And it looks like when we are oxidizing the system more and more, increasing the copper content of the slag, the magnetite content would be going down at a certain point. And this is not true, as I will show you. Uh, in a moment. Yes, 
this is similar empty data simulation of of um, of the slag as a function of KCM slag as as a function of of sulfur in the blister, and here we have different uh, silica contents of the slag, showing that the, this is mass fraction of of uh, of uh, ferric oxide in in the in the slag. And it shows that at each constant silica con concentration in the slag, our uh, ferric oxide is increasing when we are decreasing our, our uh, sulfur content. So it's systematical. So it's not. Uh, It's not real ferric oxide content what the SATMACAN is measuring because of certain things, which I will come later to. And this, this diagram also tells that, that, that uh, silica con concentration of the slag has some rather big influence on the magnetite content or ferric oxide content of the slag, which then must be taken into account in the slag cleaning operations down, downstream. Sulfur <clears throat> as such is, is, is rather low in, in the direct to blister slags because of the high oxygen degree of the system. This is again, empty data simulation uh, showing the level of, of sulfur in KCM type of slags with, with alumina and 20% silica and, and as a function of sulfur in, in the blister. So it's, it's uh, typically one order of magnitude smaller than in map making conditions where typically in industrial operations with 65% mat grade, the solubility of sulfur in slag is about half, half a percent weight percent, depending on what kind of, uh, kind of slag modifiers you may have in, in your slag. Then, then I will <clears throat> go into into some details of, of real direct to blister smelting. And uh, many of these slides, as I mentioned earlier, uh, or the simulation figures are based on, on my <clears throat> training course in Zambia some 10 years ago, where I was invited to give some, some uh, information about their slags uh, to engineers and, and uh, more, more e uh, experienced process operators. It was a two day course lasting probably six hours a day or something. And all the, the phase diagrams and, and correlations presented there were generated by MT data and its database, which in, in these copper systems was at the present, on the present level already in, in late uh, 1990s. So, so this is rather, I would say that rather kind of, kind of old fashioned data, but still, uh, quite okay in, in, in terms of what we know about the Zambia operation of today. So there are actually three direct to blister smelters in the world and they all have 
very different fluxing practices. And that is coming from the <clears throat> gang chemistry and mineralogy. And, and uh, they are all, uh, smelters are all uh, linked closely with, with a certain mine. So, so they are, uh, they are producing copper from rather limited uh, number of, of concentrates which have almost the same origin. An example of this, this is, <clears throat> this upper one is Olympic Dam smelter in, in, in Australia. And this lower one is, is the KCM smelter in, in, in northern Zambia, in Chingola town. Uh, and um, in Poland, where the first <clears throat> direct to blister smelter was, was erected and, and, and put in operation in 1978, uh, the gang material is, is high in alumina and lime. So they don't use any fluxing, extra fluxing at all. And, and in, in uh, Olympic dam smelter and in KCM smelter, the, the fluxing is, is also, it's not standard at all. In Olympic Dam, it is kind of old-fashioned iron silicate slag, but in KCM uh, smelter, the gang is high in silica, and and the slag would be silica saturated without any fluxing. So that is that fluxing kind of endpoint is moved from from. Uh, from uh, silica saturation by adding lime. And that is why I will show you different types of phase diagrams in, the, in, the, in my next slides. So how, how this, <clears throat> losses in, in copper making, how they are generated. So we have, we have two types of, of um, losses in, in all copper making and other nickel making and so on processes. We have entrainment of of the product in this in direct to blister processes, it is entrained blister in small droplets, uh, which is uh, which is often formed very, to my understanding, uh, rather close to the tapping hole, and it's it's kind of it's kind of system where you can cannot avoid draft from that molten material which is tapped and the material above which is slag or the material below which which is which is blister it is it is often entrained with this this material to be tapped. But then then the actual thing which which we are uh, interested and in, which we can control is the chemical uh, dissolution of, of of copper and, and that takes place as oxide. And that chemically dissolved uh, copper concentration is, is depending on temperature temperature, the grade of the, of the blister, so sulfur content, and then, then the fluxing chemistry. And the chemical dissolution, oxidation from blister, it, it, is, it is taking place 
through this kind of reactions, whatever they are, depending on the, on the oxidation degree of the metal in the slag. So you can you can always write down an equi equilibrium system based on gaseous oxygen dissolved element in copper and and then then that in oxidized form in slack and it can be it can be measured also in 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 industrial conditions and and plotted as as a distribution coefficient which which uh, should be scale independent and is scale, scale independent variable of of your thermodynamics and this kind of distribution coefficient data and reactions like these for met chemical metal losses in copper, nickel, tin, lead smelting, they, they are controlling the equilibria. So for copper, we, we know that it is Uh, copper oxide with oxidation degree of plus one, which is responsible for, for, for the losses. There may be or maybe not uh, sulfur species present, but it shouldn't be uh, kind of essential. Uh, most copper is dissolved as oxide. And for all conventional copper concentrates, we flux uh, the mat making and uh, blister copper processes uh, with a certain iron to silica ratio as a target, which in some smelters <clears throat> is applied as, as silica concentration of the slag as target. It means almost the same, same and behaves pretty much in the same way. So the silica con the concentration of the slag, as I already showed you earlier, has an impact on copper solubility and on dissolution of magnetite in the slag. So this is a complex a quasi ternary uh, phase diagram with with uh, oxygen isobars uh, superimposed for <clears throat> one specific uh, slag system of, of KCM smelter having having 6% uh, of lime in the slag and in total 20% of copper in slag or as a as a as a uh, separate uh, blister blister phase, which is actually present over this domain only. See, so this KCM case is, is very complex <clears throat> fluxing, fluxing uh, example because it contains in addition to lime naturally it contains man some magnesia 2% 3% magnesia and it tends to be without any addition of lime it tends to be always saturated by silica so it has the, the fluxing has very important impact in viscosity of of the of the slag and thus, thus the fluidity of the slag So what we need, what we need, and what how we do a good direct to blister slack. What we need 
as 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 a plant engineers and 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 uh, when we are managing the fluxing chemistry so iron silicate melts are sensitive to the iron to silica ratio and that must be carefully controlled and adjusted from the bedding of and mixing of the concentrates onwards. And that ensures uh, a good fluidity of the slack. So at KCM, as I said, the final fluxing adjustment is made by, by lime, adding lime and uh, that lime addition moves the slag from silica saturation, so saturation boundary of, of silica and assumably rather sticky and viscous slags. So in addition to those to kind of straightforward uh, measures, we need to maintain as low operational temperature in the furnace as possible to ensure uh, high copper reco uh, recovery primary yield of copper. Uh, we don't want to increase refractory wear, which, which, is, which, is, which is taking place at high temperatures. We don't want to have much fuel formation in, during tapping. And uh, we don't want to have carryover of copper. So mechanically entrained copper into, into the uh, slack cleaning. And slack cleaning is important in direct to blister smelting because it is it is um, high copper slag and sometimes like in the case of KCM it contains something else which is even more more valuable than copper itself and we need to take into account those things for for the profitability of the smelter so KCM raw materials have, like all Zambian and, 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 uh, and close by nearby areas in Congo, they have cobalt in their copper concentrates, which is rare. It's not common at all. And, and these cobalt and copper, they are bound with, with, uh, with, uh, uh, slack matrix very differently. Copper is rather loosely bound with, with the slack and, and cobalt is, behaves like iron. So it's, it's, it's very tightly, strongly bound with, 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 the, with the silicate itself. But here, when we are cleaning slacks, which takes place in an electric furnace, we can, we can use the residual uh, content of, of magnetite in the slag as, as a measure of, of the reduction decree. And, and this is very important because we want to follow uh, the, the progress of, of the slag cleaning. So what happens there in, in slag cleaning is because of this chemical, chemical relations between the, the, the metals so, and, and the slack matrix is itself, that means that our copper is coming first from the slag, then comes nickel, after that comes cobalt, and iron comes almost at the same time along with cobalt. So that means that, that we need to get uh, first most of cobalt most of copper out of, of the slag and then 
starts nickel cobalt uh, coming coming to the uh, EF mat, so to say, even if there is no no large concent high concentration of, of sulfur at all, along with with iron. So our our bottom metal, and that is why the slack leaning is often often made in two two steps. First, most of of copper is, is taken out, and then these are are reduced in the second slack leaning step uh, because that copper can be added into the blister copper from the from the uh, furnace uh, flash furnace, but these uh, more valuable cobalt and nickel they will be. Uh, uh, they will be separated chemically from the from the EF mat. So it is compulsory to have uh, iron in the second step of or second stage of of uh, of the slack cleaning. Otherwise, cobalt does not come out. Okay, one special feature of the electric furnace slack cleaning is that when we are taking rather much 20, 15, 20 percent copper out of the direct to blister slag, <clears throat> we are taking a lot of ferric oxide from the slag. So our slag is increasing in its silica content. And that means that, that we need to <coughs> take into account in the original uh, flash furnace fluxing also the, the behavior of, of, the, of the slag in electric furnace. And this is rather complicated issue and you need to estimate the phase boundaries of, of your slag with a um, lot of copper in it, with a lot of magnetite in it, and without them at all. And all times this must stay, this slag must stay liquid. So, so original fluxing in flash furnace is must be done in such a way that the slag is also is molten also in the electric furnace. Okay, I will conclude my my lecture by by a few words now. <clears throat> so there are not many concentrates or all bodies in the world which are suitable to direct to blister smelting. So they must be either low iron or very high in copper. Because of, of this rather complicated chemistries these ore bodies typically have, the <clears throat> smelting slag fluxing is a rather demanding task and, and it is uh, ending up with with rather unusual chemistries among the those direct to blister copper smelters in the world. So, in case of KCM smelter, so the silica saturation uh, is 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 the key point in 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 fluxing chemistries and if the <clears throat> if the lime concentration in the in the slag is not correct so the whole furnace will be operating badly they are adding their uh, the, the lime as as 
as lime as such or 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 uh, limestone which certainly have different contents of of CAO and must be taken into, into account and due to the specific mode of operation all direct to blister slags contain from 15 to 20 percent of dissolved copper uh, so that is rather high fraction but because of the simple operation of of the of the furnace and and very straightforward layout of the smelter direct to blister uh, is uh, suitable uh, for certain raw materials in the world. And what is what is also strange from map making point of view is, is that that uh, these direct to blister smelting conditions are not suitable as such for pure iron silicate slags. They are they are kind of disintegrated or, or split into into solids when we are going to so high high oxygen partial pressures which are required in the blister making so so the, this also means that that direct to blister slags need some modi modifiers to keep the slag stable and to, in order to allow tapping of the slag from from uh, from the ferns. Okay, I think this is this was all I had in mind for you. And there are not too many papers published on direct to blister smelting, but I collected a couple of new ones for your information and and um, they are mostly written by by um, my first doctoral student Ilka Koyo and myself uh, this is from Australia so this is my con contact information if somebody is, is needing further uh, further uh, details from direct to blister bl blisters melting but but uh, this is also giving you a link to to Alta university's school of chemical engineering if somebody of you is interested in in, in uh, extending uh, your knowledge abroad, for, for example, in this country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pekka. I think this a uh, good presentation and very deep. And I just know that Ilika Koyo is your first student, Pekka. <laughs> I read a lot, a lot, very, uh, a lot of uh, his works. Okay, right now I want to uh, to open the question and answer session. So for my student, you can raise your hand and then uh, mention your name and then and then uh, don't forget to unmute your microphone and then ask the question. Okay, now I open the questions. Or you can directly uh, unmute your microphone and ask the questions. Good afternoon, sir. Yes, what's your name? Darmi? Yes, I am Darmi. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, my English is not so good. <laughs> I hope uh, not misinformation, uh, miscommunication uh, among us. Uh, I want to ask you about uh, 
general process of uh, direct to blister uh, of copper. Uh, I am interesting at uptake uh, uptake stuff, sir. Maybe Darmi, you can uh, put on your uh, your your video also, so we can see and oh, yeah. can can see your face. Okay, sir. Okay. <laughs> This is Darby. Uh, okay. Okay. Hi. And you are interested in? In soft reaction, Becca. Soft reaction. Uh, in no. Soft. Uh, uh, in uptake soft. Uh, and at uh, uptake soft, uh, when gas gas is out from the settler, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it take a lot of energy, uh, a lot of heat. Like that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Well, it, it's yeah, uptake is is um, is so short uh, that it, its heat losses are not substantial. So so the temperature of the of the of gas is almost the same in settler and in in the intake of of the of the boiler. So I don't think the heat losses in uptake. Oh are more than probably five to 10 degrees or something. Oh, so in uptake stuff, uh, we, we can uh, use uh, heat for boiler like that. Yeah, yes. Oh. And it, it is often used for, I didn't mention it here, but, but if, if, you are, if you are able to listen the talk on next Friday, I will I will discuss that in more detail. Uh, uh, uptake shaft chemistry is often used for oxidizing residual sulfur or sulfides from from the food dust. So they are adding some air or oxygen into uptake. Uh, okay, sir. Uh, it, can we use in order to oxidize uh, sulfur to minimum? Okay, sir. Uh, can we use uh, the heat for uh, the, uh, the ignition in reaction shaft, sir? Heat, uh, heat on gas uh, on uptake shaft. What? For what, Darmi? For, for ignition, sir. For, uh, for heat. Uh, we need for reaction stuff like that. Okay, you know, yes, that, that was actually the original way of operating flash furnaces. So the, the uh, process gas going into the reaction soft was preheated by, by the energy of the boiler. And, but it's, not, it's not, not anymore used because of certain issues. Those um, heat exchangers, which were actually uh, preparing that, that uh, high temperature oxygen uh, air mixture, they were blocked so often. And um, that is why that has been abandoned since probably 20 years or 30 years. Very few smelters are using <clears throat> heat recovery for heating the inlet input material. It was it was actually the, the issue of of the Autokumpu patent originally in, in 1948 or nine when when they when they patented this flash melting process preheating of, of process gas, but it's not used anymore. Oh, okay, sir. Uh, last question, maybe, sir? Yeah, please. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, correct me if I wrong, but I conclude that uh, purity of copper, we can produce a bit uh, through, through the blister, uh, through the direct to blister process. Uh, uh, it is depends to oxygen amounts. Uh, so, but but doesn't it can take copper uh, to the selector 
uh, if we use uh, a lot of oxygen uh, and how can we get high purity of copper and at the other hand we try to reduce copper losses like that yeah i think you <clears throat> you were mentioning mentioning the dependence between between the sulfur content of 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 the blister and and then um, then <clears throat> copper content of, of the slag. Yes. And here actually <clears throat> is that dependence. Here is 1% 1 1 sulfur in blister, here is zero. And some direct blister smelters are producing 0 0.3, 0 0.25 uh, sulfur uh, content in blister. So, so there, with this KCM case, uh, there is how much that is. Twen 20, from 22 till to 24, depending on, on the, on the uh, silica content in slag. And if, if we are producing only Blister containing one percent sulfur. It's 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 twelve, thirteen percent. So so the the dependence of copper and slag is very strong uh, as a function of of sulfur content of blister. Yes, yes, it, that is true. And and but the removal of sulfur from Blister copper in anode furnaces, it's it's not very very fast. So so you are in big smelters, you are probably getting benefit out of low um, sulfur content in blister, and on the other hand, uh, slack cleaning process, the first stage where you are only taking out copper, that is very very fast. So so time-wise is perhaps uh, easier to operate in here because you can save time in fire refining and you don't lose so much in slack cleaning. Yes, this is rather, oh. rather complicated, complicated case, but you're, you're, you're right. It, it has a strong strong uh, de uh, dependence, um, so meaning copper in slag is strongly dependent on the, sulf on the sulfur in, in, in blister, but, but there are other issues which are, which are determining the practical uh, operational endpoint of the smelting. Okay, hear me. Okay, okay, thank you so clear? much, Mr. Okay. Pekka. It's so clear, sir. Okay, next question. So you uh, you can uh, open your video and then unmute your microphone and then just ask. Okay, well, why think other question, Pekka? In Indonesia, uh, we have like calcopyrite uh, concentrate produced from two biggest mining uh, company, Freeport, Freeport and also Aman Mineral. They produce huge amount of concentrate. And then uh, sooner, they will get flash melting furnace in close to, uh, to, the, to in the East Java, Pekka. So as you mentioned that uh, flash smelting furnace, which is uh, using direct to blister copper smelting, it's very limited in, in the world. It's, uh, what do you think the best uh, flash melting? It is direct to blister or like in, uh, in Finland, it is a flash melting combined with a pyrsmid converter to process the calcopyrite because you say that 
direct to blister is uh, good for mineral that contains high copper and low iron. Thank you, Becca. Yeah. Well, I, I'm not salesman of all the things, but, <laughs> <laughs> okay. but still, still from many reasons, uh, like environmental issues. If you are smelting um, chalcopyrite concentrate, I think the most efficient and uh, environmentally safe safest uh, solution is plus melting plus converting uh, process. So I'm not I'm not sure what is the kind of break even of of direct to blister smelting can <clears throat> pure chalcopyrite smelted in economically in 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 direct to blister I, i'm not not sure about that i i did some calculations in in one of my papers which are which is is uh, cited in the, in the last slide of of this presentation but but um, it's a question of 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 the amount of slag produced so if if um, if the amount of slag becomes too large, too big, too high, uh, that means that that your slag losses of copper, so copper circulating through the slag cleaning becomes too much. Mm. And, and that means that, that if you have uh, chalcocytic uh, concentrate, so containing something like bonite and, and, and this type of degraded chalcopyrite minerals. So then, then you are, it's possible for, for you to, to, to use direct to blister smelting, but with normal chalcopyrite, I don't think it is feasible. Okay. Okay. So, thank, so. You. thank you, Becca. Yeah. Okay. Next questions. Just unmute uh, and then show your video. Okay. Okay, Alice. Good afternoon, Mr. Becca. Hi. My name is Alif. I want to ask you a question. Uh, you say that at the action shaft you must prevent the feet from colliding. I wonder what would happen if there is collision in there. In flight, in flight. Yeah. So yeah, there are <clears throat> claims in, in the literature that, that certain type of burner, concentrate burner design would increase collisions and um, at least some probably 10, 15 years ago, Japanese flash melters proposed different types of, of concentrate burners claiming that this kind of agglomeration uh, reduces dust formation. Dust is kind of thing you, you, ha you have always in flash melting be because you have this suspension and fine fraction of, of, of material is, is typically carried uh, along with, with the off gas. And, and the kind of well operated flash furnace has 5% dust, 5% of the, of the input. That means that, that this, this dust is, it contains a lot of copper and it is, it is circulated within the smelter. So this could be reduced if, 
if such a phenomenon, I mean agglomeration of, of the suspension could be maintained. But I haven't seen any kind of real results or documents that somebody has managed to do that. So yeah, you're right. It, it would be beneficial uh, if, if that, that kind of agglomeration could be, could be uh, made uh, on low levels, levels of, of, the, of, the, of the reaction soft. It's, it's not beneficial if the feed is agglomerated before feeding, because then it doesn't heat up. But if that takes place in the reaction shaft and after the ignition, it may be beneficial. Uh, one more thing, sir. Yeah, please. If there is many collision in the reaction shaft, there will be slight form in, in the flight. What do you mean? At your slide, with few collisions, there will be no slacks formed in, sli in flight. At reaction shaft. I didn't quite, quite get your idea now. What is your, what is your idea? You say that, uh, Alif, what is your idea? Can you repeat? Mm. Maybe, which, maybe which slide? With which slide? slide that you in suspension oxidation slide, heat transfer issue. Suspension oxidized, Pekan. Suspension oxidation, yeah. The oxidation of suspension, yes. The third. The, 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 third, the, the third bullet, okay. Yes, third bullet. Few collision in suspension and no formation in of slack in flight. What will happen if there is slack formation in flight? Well, the time span for for the material to, to fly in the reaction shaft, if if that is that is three seconds, I would I would guess that if 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 a particles collide the particle size is just increased but that that time span is so short that you really don't uh, see any kind of slack formation it's it's only only increase in particle size what that means in the settler so would it be beneficial to the slag and blister or slag and mat formation, maybe, maybe not. Because if we have very fine dispersion of material, uh, so they may react faster in, in, the, in the settler. On the other hand, if we have big droplets of blister forming in the reaction shaft, they may descend. So settle in, in, the, in, the, in the settler faster and that kind of material in the slag would be reduced by co concentration. I don't know how, how much uh, entrained uh, copper is left after, after few hours uh, residence time in the settler. Uh, we are actually doing some, some research on that in, in, in the research groups at Aldo now. But uh, I think that most, uh, most of entrained copper is, is anyway caused by, by, by suction in, in the tapping hole and not not by by the by the not by the material which has not been settled, uh, and it's too fine, too fine to settle. 
So yeah, that 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 is a rather complicated thing as well. So so <clears throat> I would guess that the primary importance or or effect of agglomeration in reaction shaft would be lowered blue dust generation. I wouldn't guess anything else. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay. Okay, guys, uh, we still have uh, 14 minutes. So maybe we still have like three or four questions more. So please just uh, open your video and then you can just unmute your microphone and ask. Okay, Magastia. Okay, just open your video and then ask. Uh, okay, hello, hello, Mr. Pekka. Good afternoon. Hi. Uh, I want to ask you uh, maybe two questions. Um, before that, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Agastya uh, from East Java. Okay. Uh, maybe from what you share that this flash melting is uh, uh, combine any process into into one mechanism and then of course that uh, because of that is better than other technology in maybe in time and economic so my first question is uh, what's the limitation with with this smelter technology uh, or is there any weakness in this technology uh, the first I know is uh, you just said that this technology is just for uh, highly copper and yeah, and a highly copper. So what's the limitation? Yes, Becca. One, one feature of, of um, flash melting is that it has been over the years it has been uh, fine-tuned and developed towards big smelters so all all big smelters so smelting more than 200,000 tons of copper per year they are flash melters. And that has been the target, target kind of custom uh, base for, for Autotech. And it is because, because of, uh, how to say, uh, some kind of engineering philosophy so autotech and flash melting technology has al always been offered as a package containing containing smelting and, it, and its auxiliary uh, equipment like 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 concentrate burners feeders uh, bedding plants and so on and then the the downstream operations, including uh, heat recovery and acid plant. So, so this is rather heavy solution for small, small smelters, which may be today allowed to operate in countries which are not so much uh, worried about the about the environmental issues, but for countries which are taking care of their their nature and 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 uh, waters and and uh, safety of 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 the of the operating staff uh, and op safety of operations. So those other technologies are uh, not applicable at all because because they are not 
kind of covering all the functions of, of, of smelting. There are still smelters in the world which are exhausting all sulfur into atmosphere. There are smelters who are not putting uh, any effort to the safety of, of, of the operation. The operators may be, may be in danger from one day to another and so on. So, In, in, um, in flash melting, so, so the small smelters typically producing 10,000, 20,000, up to 50,000 tons of copper, they are not the focus, focus group of, of Autotech. They never have been, even if some 50 years ago. Was. So uh, some very, very small copper flash melting furnaces were built for example, in India, which which were producing only fifty thousand tons of copper, but they are they are not actually actually in, in the in the <clears throat> so how to, how to say in in the in the custom base of, of today's flash melting at all. So I I would I would keep, take this as as a as a major kind of. Um, not weakness, but characteristic uh, property of, of flash melting. So you don't see flash melters erected anywhere, which are producing less than 100,000 tons a year, copper or nickel. Yeah. Because melters are anyway smaller, but, but yeah. Yeah, but from from technological point of view, I don't see any any weaknesses. One <clears throat> one um, remarkable feature of flash melting, uh, when I look at its kind of historical development, which I will be presenting on, on next Friday a bit, is is that the original flash melting furnace, which was put in operation in Finland a bit more than 70 years ago, 71 years ago. Uh, it produced 20,000 tons of copper a year. Today, that same firm is, is producing 200 tons of copper a year. So that increase in production capacity is, is tenfold or even more and, and this is this is something which which is uh, explaining uh, technological kind of features of, of flash melting it, it can be scaled up very much we have flash melters which are are producing more than 400,000 tons of copper per year so that means that they are, they are <clears throat> uh, smelting from 1.2 to 1.5 million tons of concentrate every year. And they are very big units. No other technology can compare in copper making with that. I don't know whether I answered your question properly, but, but <laughs> this is one, one feature I, I, I think it is important, environment, safety, uh, emissions to atmosphere, water, ground, soil, whatever. So environmental issues are they are superior in, in flash melting. It's not only the chemistry, and, but it's all the furnace design and all the auxiliary equipment, training of staff and so on. Okay, Agas, is that clear? So it is uh, difficult uh, to be, I mean, it is difficult 
to be uh, run for like small capacity. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Imam, it's not difficult, but it's not economical. Yes. Yes. I mean, yes, economic, not economical. <laughs> okay. One more question because uh, we still have four, min four minutes. So one more question, guys, before you uh, going to other class. So just raise your hand or just open your uh, video and then ask the question. One more question. Thank you, Mr. Becca, for your answer. Okay, Samsul. Samsul, can you, you can open your, your video. Uh, check, check. Yes, it's okay. Uh, uh, excuse me, mister. Uh, uh, maybe uh, this is a simple question, but I want to know uh, a call copyright or uh, copper or uh, maybe contain some valuable metal like gold, silver, and rare earth element. Uh, what happened with this metal in direct blister copper process? Uh, or what we do with that? Uh, gold or silver or RAA? -A. Yes, those <clears throat> precious metals. We have been measuring distribution coefficients for them in, in conditions of blister, blister making recently. And uh, they are captured effectively by, by blister. So if, if you are talking about gold, silver, platinum, palladium, rhodium, what may be there, there in the, out of these, these two groups of metals, they are dissolving very well and completely in the blister copper. But if we have something else, you mentioned, rare earths, they are so, so stable, forming so stable oxides that they deport in slag. Hmm. But rare earths, they, they are like, like lime or, or, or MGO in terms of, of the stability of the oxide. So, so you can't recover rare earths from copper making uh, if you don't treat the, the slag they are all going going into the slag phase and if you are treating the slag with some like hydromet met methods that is that is then possible but but not from blister copper. Silver, gold, platinum, palladium, rhodium. Yes, but but if oxide is very stable, so no. Then there are some some elements like tin, uh, gallium, indium. Uh, germanium, which are deporting in flue dust. And then if you have large, large fractions of, of such metals in your raw materials, you probably think about treating your flue dust separately. You don't circulate it. Uh, back into the smelting, but you treat it. Uh, you bleed out some of these, these uh, impurities or, or valuables. Okay, Samsung, is this is clear? So guys, right now is exactly at uh, 3 p.m. So I know that you still have a lot of questions, but 
I don't know, Becca, is, do you still accept one more question maybe? <laughs> because students yeah. are still, still active? Okay, uh, last question. Last question after Samsul. Thank you, Prof, uh, for your answer. Thank you very much. Okay. One, one more question before Pekka left. <laughs> okay. Afif. Yes, Afif. Okay. Okay. Thanks for the chance. Uh, professor, <laughs> uh, could you hear my voice? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> As uh, based on your explanation, you uh, the furnace is uh, produce the pure copper, right? But in the other ways, this lake is also contain amount of copper concentration on it, right? So in this case, we need. Uh, <laughs> so in this case, we need. Recovery process, recovery process on slags to reduce the number of the concentration of the copper, so it could be uh, reduced on the next process. So, could you tell us the the, the process, the exact process of the recovery slag in uh, in this furnace? Thank you, sir. Thank you, professor. I mean, yeah, it's it's a electric furnace. Uh, uh, reduction by coke. That is that is what what is used, and then uh, I think that that will be also also uh, the technology in in years to come. So so uh, electric furnace because temperature must be maintained, and electrodes are typically Söderberg type of of electrodes which are consumable and then then you add add coke for for uh, making the chemical re uh, reduction of copper oxides iron 3 oxide and, and 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 the other oxides and that is a batch process and and you need um, as I said, typically in first uh, furnace, you are taking out only copper, which is then fed into the anode furnaces. And the second step of, of slack cleaning makes, uh, they are actually calling it matte, but it doesn't contain uh, much uh, sulfur. So a, a metal phase, which is, which is rich in iron, it will be, <clears throat> it will be containing 30 to 40% iron and then some copper, and depending on what you are taking out from the slag, nickel, uh, co cobalt, uh, and so on. Polish smelters are taking lead uh, in this, this step from the slack. So, so yes, it is, it is a process in, also in that smelting, but it is carried out in a different way uh, than in that smelting where, where the level of copper is only say 3%, 2%. And here it, it may be 20. But it's standard te technology in, in mat melt, mat smelting anyway. So that is that is nothing nothing very very special. Okay. 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 I think uh, Pekka, it's already the time. <laughs> Some students <laughs> have to go to other classes, but I know that the student is like still have a lot of questions, but uh, because the time. If you still have more questions, guys, don't forget to join in the next Friday. So me and Pekka will present uh, more or less uh, about still, uh, the topic is still about copper processing, it's about flash melting, and I will present about flash converting. So if you still have 
uh, some question, you can uh, join the the next uh, the next uh, meeting in the in the conference. But the next the next conference is like op open for public, so we will have uh, much more attendance. Okay, Pekka, thank you very much. Oh By God. the way, Pekka, can thank you very much, get, Professor. Can we get the the slide, Pekka? Yeah, sure. I okay. will send it. Yeah. Yes. And also, I will request you to give one question for the exam. The exam will be held on the next week. So if you don't mind, you can give us uh, one question. Uh, you can send me the, the question to my email. So that question uh, is about copper extraction using pyrometallurgical roads. So, so, so one question will be in English, of course. Okay. You. I'll okay. Yeah. <laughs> and right. don't worry. Don't worry. I will do the correction. I will not ask you to, to check the answer from the student because it's 80, 80 papers you will check. So, <laughs> so don't worry. So don't worry. I just ask you the question for the student. That's okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Pekka. Again, thank you very much. So we really appreciate that uh, you can come and give a lecture to uh, Indonesian students. So let's give applause to Pekka, guys. Okay, see you on Friday. Okay, thank you, Pekka. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.